Hello, one and all, and welcome. Travel encounters. How do you handle this in D&D or whatever other tabletop RPG that you play? There are some different approaches, some different methods, and uh, there's not really a right or a wrong answer. Everything has pros and cons, upsides and downsides. I'm going to talk about some different approaches, some different methods that you can use to see what happens when the players go from the protected city to the borderlands region to the wilderness to eventually the dungeon or whatever other adventure location. So I have a cool idea. I'm going to run through a sequence here of one of the approaches to travel encounters, the random encounter check. I'm going to improv some descriptions. I'm going to actually roll dice using some random encounter tables that I've created that I use in my own games. And this will just give a look at how this might play out. You can skip ahead if you want and get right back into the information and advice, but I think this will be neat to give a, a sample for a few minutes here. You have now passed beyond the limits of civilization and areas where guardsmen and rangers will patrol. Now you are in the wilds. This first day of travel, you pass through a stretching marshland with low pockets of standing water and small lakes, swaths of grasses, thickets of trees. You know there are some dangers in this region. The first eight hours of your travel, the bulk of your walking and traveling this first day, is peaceful with nothing more than little bits of wildlife here and there. You soon after begin to look for a place to camp. You find a location that is dry and not down too much where it's wet and make your camp, eat, begin resting, sleeping in shifts. A number of hours pass. We are going now into night. Thus far, things have been calm. You awaken the next day. Prepare yourselves for the journey ahead and continue with your traveling. You walk throughout the morning and into the afternoon. You find some wild berries to eat. You catch a few fish. There's plentiful water, even a little bit of rain to collect. So far, all has been calm. You are well into the late afternoon of the second day of travel. It is when the sun is starting to get low in the western horizon when something occurs. There. About 60 feet away, in some tall reeds and by a thicket of trees, are creatures. One is humanoid-like, but with a serpent's head. He has a bow in hand and arrows, and as he spots your party, he begins dipping his arrow in some sort of pouch. This thing is not alone. Nearby him are... Three massive snakes rising up out of the reeds in the water. Huge things. Constrictors big enough to swallow a man whole. Malice and hunger are in the eyes of these serpentine gazes. Roll for initiative. You have survived the conflict with the yuan Ti and the three giant constrictors. Wounded, a few of you envenomed, you decide it would be better to rest here for now. The sun sets and the frogs and the buzzing insects commence their nocturnal chorus. Fortunately for you all, the night passes by without incident. And on this third day of travel, the landscape changes. The land becomes a gloomy swamp. It is drear, misty. Even the sky becomes uh, choked with these brooding clouds. Here you pass through the ruins of Karatha Droon, the cursed city. Clearly, this is a more dangerous area. Through the morning and into the afternoon, you travel. Your pace is slowed down by the difficult and thick terrain, the sodden ground, and these strange ruins lurk here and there to either side. You've passed beyond the bounds of the old ruined city, and now the ruins are scattered things. Here and there, an old outpost or stronghold, or maybe a village, all toppled down in states of decrepitness, overgrown by mosses. All are inhabited by vermin and crows, and who knows what other fell things might be in these shadowy ruins that dot the landscape of this swamp. Afternoon fades into evening, and night falls. Darkness covers the land. You make your camp 
taking shelter in what protected area you can find. In the distance you hear some howl, some wail. What is that? A savage beast, a monstrous thing, a moaning undead? Night deepens. Whoever is on watch hears the dull crackle of your fire and keeps ears and eyes alert. It is in the blackest hour of night that an incident occurs. It is currently Varric's watch. You are awake, your allies are sleeping. Varric, I need you to make a perception check. 17? That's good enough. There, about 30 feet away, in the dim and the gloom, behind some toppled down chunks of rubble, you spot movement. There is but a single figure, humanoid in shape, bipedal, a lurking thing, and you swear you catch a glint of a baleful glowing eye. Whatever the thing is, it does not approach your camp. It stays there and then slips out of view. You awaken your allies? Very well. Your entire party is awake now. Varric said he saw something, some vaguely humanoid-like shape over there, not far away. What is this lurker in the darkness? Is it still there? Waiting? Watching? Okay, brave adventurers, do you do anything about this? Travel encounters are a very common element in RPGs. How do you handle those? What happens between point A to B to C to D? How do you handle that? Do you roll for random encounters? Do you just avoid it altogether and just get straight into the actual dungeon? Do you have some kind of hybrid system? Do you use some tables that you roll on? How much prep time do you spend? There's a lot of different ways that you can handle what happens during travel in RPGs. I'm gonna cover some of the main approaches, I'll say like three different common, typical approaches that all have some pros and some cons to them. Everything in RPG is gonna have a pro and a con. Nothing is perfect. Everything will have some kind of price you have to pay, some kind of hurdle you have to get over, or something you have to sacrifice. So keep that in mind. And of course, these are not gonna be the only ways that you can handle travel encounters, but this is gonna cover a lot of the main bases. So the first approach is random encounters. We're all familiar with that. It's something that gets talked about quite a bit. I would say that even in a lot of games, it's just assumed that at some point there's gonna be some role that the GM makes for a random encounter. The party is traveling through some area that has some level of danger to it, and the GM rolls whatever the dice is and gets high enough on the thing, and monsters appear, roll for initiative. So yeah, random encounters, they're cool, or maybe not cool, depends on what you think about it. What are the pros, what are the cons? Okay, pros. One, the world feels alive and inhabited. Stuff lives in this world. That sense of immersion and of a, of a living world is awesome. It makes the game just that much more enjoyable or that much deeper. Stuff lives out there in the forest or in the cave or on top of the hill or whatever it is. Uh, two, there's a sense that Danger could happen at any moment. That danger, that tension, that chance for conflict and the conflict itself, that really gives energy to your game. It gets the players engaged. It gives you something to work with, some kind of story, right? Like that tension and, and, and conflict, that is like the fuel in the vehicle that is your game. Three, random encounter tables are cool. I would just say that random roll tables in general are cool because they are, and that's like part of the magic of D&D. But specifically, I really like making random encounter tables. Actually, here's a, a look at some that I've made, and there's different ways you can handle random encounter tables. This one is based off of environments. It's a pretty generalized one. You also could make a random encounter table that's based off of one specific region in your world, or maybe even just one specific location, like this dungeon, this uh, woods, uh, these ruins, has this specific encounter table. Um, I have a lot of results on mine. It doesn't have to have this many results. You could have one that just has like eight 
or 10 or six uh, or four or whatever. Also on my random encounter document, I have this danger level chart that helps me determine if a, an encounter occurs. So when the characters are traveling through an area that does have some level of danger, low, moderate, high, or extreme, I roll a d20 and that will determine if an encounter happens. I also roll time elapsed dice that will determine when I will check again for another potential encounter. So it really is pretty randomized. The cons of random encounters, unfortunately, are kind of a lot. Um, it can disrupt the session flow. The GM has to consult these different charts and do rolls and has to be thinking about the random encounter possibilities while also thinking about the other things that are happening with the story and the, the players are, you know, they're always doing something that the, the GM wants to pay attention to. So there is a bit of disruption and then the GM is going to have to on the fly you know, figure out what's the map, what's the miniatures, or if it's theater of the mind, at least still figure out where it's, you know, where the encounter is taking place at, and then make notes, you know, what monsters are involved, what are their hit points, roll for initiative. So there is it's kind of this pause, or maybe lots of small pauses, and then here and there are kind of a bigger one that happens. So that can disrupt the flow some. I mean, that's kind of what happens in tabletop RPGs anyways. But this does introduce, you know, even more of that. Another con is random encounters sometimes can feel meaningless. We don't know who these creatures are, where do they come from? They just kind of show up and then we kill them and loot their bodies. If there's too much of that, yes, there is a risk of the game devolving into murder hobos. A third con is that these random encounters sometimes are very plain. They're just these plain, straightforward encounters. You know, ogre and 1d6 goblins appear here you are in some relation to each other, fight. Now there's not really anything wrong with plain and straightforward encounters. In and of itself, that's fine. But if you have a lot of those or too many of those, it can make things start to feel a bit stale. Another con is that random encounters can distract from the story. You know, particularly if there's an important story or some kind of goal and everyone is excited about that and engaged and invested and you've prepared and here we go and oh no, there's bandits on the road now and there are uh, the hungry hippogriffs coming down out of the sky and we don't always want to have this random encounter chance going on. The next two potential problems are, are sort of related to each other, but they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. One problem is that the random encounters could end up posing too little challenge to the players. Like, let's say the characters are fully rested and have their resources or most of their resources and thus that makes them a lot more powerful, then they're going to probably wallop whatever comes their way. Um, or if the GM rolls and rolls pretty low on the random encounter table and gets like the the, the weak encounter. Um, so especially in, in like fifth edition D&D, &D, if you just play like just the rules as they are core, uh, you know, the, the, the characters might be full on resources when the random encounter occurs and then they just unload everything they have and demolish the creatures and then take a, a rest, like a long rest, and then just regain all their hit points, all their everything back, and it's just like, Broom! it's like the random encounter never happened at all. Uh, thanks for the free XP, GM. Oh, yeah, that's another problem, is that uh, too many random encounters, it can, like, mess with the, with the, the, the level up progression. Like, it can cause these XP increases that the GM had not anticipated. Okay, so then on the other end of the spectrum of the encounters can be too easy, they can also be too hard, too much of a challenge. Like if the result on the random table is like the strongest creature, and then the characters uh, can, could get in over their heads. It really depends on their level and what gets rolled and all of that. Now, of course, the GM could prep a random encounter table where the encounters are balanced. They're not objective, they're subjective to a specific location. Like in this dungeon, there are these four or six potential random encounters. And yeah, you know, one or two of the fights are a little bit easier and one or two are a little bit harder, but more or less these encounters are appropriate to the level of this dungeon or the level of this adventure. So that is a way to mitigate the real swinginess. Um, though there is something cool about having these objective 
random encounter tables that are, you know, in this region of this world, that's what lives there. It doesn't matter what level the party is. The world doesn't contort itself in this contrived way to fit the level of the party. The world is the world. And if you characters want to go off and venture through the, the, the labyrinth of madness, the random encounter table can go up to some very deadly things that you might not survive. Okay, so how do we mitigate these different cons? There are, there are always ways, solutions to, to mitigate problems in D&D. Um, okay, so one thing you can do is you can have random encounter maps ready in advance. And these could be generalized things, um, just like the forest map, arctic map, swamp map, caves map, ruins map, etc. And you can even get creative with uh, reusing these random encounter maps for future encounters. Like you could do the simple things like just flip the map so it's facing the other way. That can make it look pretty different. You can focus the action on one part of the map on one encounter, and then on a different encounter, focus the action on a different part of the map. So that will help with the disruption of the flow. That will help uh, make things faster and more efficient. To make the encounters a little bit more dynamic and interesting and not get scale, you can use a encounter circumstance table. I actually rolled on that during that little intro bit. Here it is. I actually put this out in a recent newsletter. I'll put a link to it down in the video description. Um, you can get it for free on my Patreon page. Uh, there are also some really cool rewards and exclusive content for patrons who subscribe there. So check that out too. But uh, if you want, you can just grab this and it's 100 different situations or circumstances in which the uh, monsters find themselves when you know when the player characters come across them and this can really make things come to life it adds personality and story and little situations maybe one of the monsters is already badly hurt and it's it's there on the ground and it's not really an encounter that's about fight 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 straightforward monsters want to rob you or eat you maybe the creature is insane or cursed or has been magically mutated and is wandering around in this bizarre state maybe the monster is running away from a stronger monster maybe the monster is constructing some kind of defense location or digging up the ground it knows that there's some kind of buried treasure nearby and is trying to find it so this can help bring things to life and avoid the, uh, the, the staleness problem. Another thing this makes me think of is you can, on your random encounter tables, have non-combat encounters. You can have like skill challenge type encounters. You can have locations of interest where the characters find some unique spot and that can help bring out some world building, some lore, um, or just giving an interesting feeling to the current environment. Um, there could be interactive NPCs, like there's some hermit that lives out there, or a traveling merchant going from one place to another, or a rival adventuring party, or a lone wizard. I mean, there's just all kinds, endless numbers of different non-combat NPC interactions that occur. And the threat of combat can exist in these miscellaneous situations. It's not like they all just have to be these perfectly serene and harmless things. Um, but that's not like the main primary initial occurrence. It's not just roll for initiative. There is some other type of exploration or role playing that occurs or some kind of challenge that really you want to use skills to try to overcome it. There are a couple house rules that I implement in my fifth edition games, and these help just the game in general, um, but they also help when it comes to random encounters. I use these rules for, for grittiness or gritty realism, as it might be called. So one house rule I use is that when characters finish a long rest, they do not get that automatic refill of all their hit points. They still recover uh, hit dice equal to half their level like normal, they can still spend hit dice to recover hit points like normal. Nothing else changes. Just they don't get that video game like, broom, you were dying and now you're all better. So that can make random encounters actually have more impact and more consequence. That helps because the character's hit points are not this forever refilling health bar that really just takes away from the 
medium to long term incrementally increasing danger that an adventure can pose. The second house rule I use is that if a character, or creature really, gets reduced to zero hit points but survives, doesn't die, gets healed or stabilizes or whatever, that imposes one level of exhaustion every time. And what that exhaustion is, it's an abstraction that represents an injury. The character got injured, you got knocked to zero hit points, you were like on death's doorstep. So um, the exhaustion levels can increase if that happens, you know, multiple times. And that introduces more consequence, more realism, more grittiness. And that can, again, lend to the danger and the impact of random encounters. And a level of exhaustion, you know, that only gets removed by taking a long rest that removes one level. Or if you want, you can even make it to where uh, someone has to succeed on a medicine check, like a DC 15 medicine check and use a use from a healer's kit while taking care of or tending to the injured character during a rest in order to remove a level of exhaustion. Those two house rules are probably two of my favorite and they really help the game a lot, I think, at least my style of game that I like to play. It doesn't really radically change 5th edition. It's not a, a major house rule, but it's definitely enough to where it's noticeable and it increases the tension and the sense of danger and realism. To help with the problem of rolling monsters that are too weak, they don't have to just jump out and attack the party. Like the second random encounter I rolled, I just rolled one vampire spawn. Yeah, maybe a vampire spawn would go attack a whole party, maybe it's it's so hungry for blood, I don't know. But it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe it's going to watch the characters for a while and then sneak away and go inform other vampires that it's associated with. The party gets to decide what are they going to do? Or are the characters going to go pursue that creature, or try to find it, kill it, track it down, talk to it, just let it go? Or with the opposite problem where you can come across random encounters that are too strong, too much of a challenge, the GM could be thoughtful or mindful of that and give the characters a chance to run away, at least give them a decent chance. If not, go ahead and just allow them if they want to um, immediately just flee. The second approach to travel encounters is the opposite of random encounters, and it is no random encounters. I know that lots of GMs actually favor this. They just don't mess with random encounters at all. No tables, no rolling on stuff, no checking for encounters, no having to prep things on the fly and improvise stuff. It's too much work, or it causes too much problems, so just don't bother with it. There are two pros to this. One is that you get right into the main story or into the dungeon. It just keeps things right on track and you're only focused on what is important, what is pertinent to the actual campaign, to the, to the campaign plot line at hand. And two, it keeps things less complicated. Being a GM can be a lot of work. It doesn't have to be, it just depends upon what style of GM you are, how you like to run your game. Some GMs don't have the time, the patience, the desire to have that kind of uh, mental juggling so many things. They don't want that complicated of a task. So this is the perfect solution. Just don't bother with the random encounters at all. So along with those two pros, there are two cons. One is that there isn't quite the same sense of the world being alive and inhabited. I'm not saying it lacks that sense altogether, not at all, but you get less of a sense of that. If it were just, okay, the hobbits set out from Hobbiton, stop over for a bit in Bree, meet up with Strider and Gandalf, and then you're at the Mines of Moria. You set out from your party's guild hall, you travel through the marshland and through the murky ruins, and now you're at the threshold of the lair of Korgonthrix. So what happened in between? Is there just nothing important there? Does nothing live there? Are there no dangers? So the no random encounters definitely can feel more game e like more mechanical and less an immersive world. The second con is that as much as this style does focus things on just the the story and the adventure at hand, it's that's a double-edged sword. It can also make things feel contrived or railroaded. Like the only things that happen are the things that 
The GM has specifically prepared and nothing can ever veer off of that track. So again, we'll feel more game game and less immersive shared living story game. There aren't really a lot of tips I can give to mitigate the cons of using no random encounters. I think just the main thing I would say is to just make the story and uh, the dungeon as engrossing as possible. If you have a great story and fun, engrossing, dynamic dungeons, the players aren't going to really notice or even think about the lack of travel encounters. The third approach, which is sort of this balancing um, a middle ground between random encounters and no random encounters, is planned travel encounters. And in this style, there are encounters that happen throughout the travels along the way, but the DM prepares them in advance. So that keeps the plus side of the world feeling alive and inhabited, because there were Yanti and constrictors in the marsh, and vampires lurking about in the ruins of the cursed city. They just didn't have to be randomly rolled and improvised on the fly. Another upside of this is that the travel encounters can directly be a part of the adventure. They can contribute to the story of the adventure. They can contribute to the theme and the tone. Between Hobbiton and Bree, there is this encounter with one of the Black Riders looking for the ring. That's awesome. And between Bree and Rivendale, the encounter at Weathertop at a really dynamic, interesting location, cool terrain, has a bit of lore and history for the world building. There are the monsters that appear in the night. It's a, it's a hard battle for your life, and it relates to the story and the theme of the campaign. And that leads to the third pro is that the Random encounters are more dynamic, are more interesting. They don't have quite that same straightforward, just plain, simple, potentially even stale feeling encounters. They have cool motivations, cool circumstances, cool terrain, what have you. There's really only one main downside to the planned travel encounters, and that is the DM's workload. I'm talking about prep time, because not only are you going to have to prepare the whole adventure story, the dungeon location or the adventure location that you go to, but you also have to prep additional maps, additional locations. Think about how do the encounters fit in, not just at the dungeon, but into these other um, secondary locations as well. So this increases the preparation time and the amount of resources that the DM has to draw upon. So that really is a price that has to be paid. The GM's time and creative energy and finding maps, etc. I do have a couple tips to mitigate this downside of the increased DM prep time and investment. They're not like magic potion quick fixes. They're more deeper solutions, more generalized ongoing solutions. The first one is that you have to improve as a GM, uh, specifically learn to prep faster and more efficiently. Now, I cannot go into this video all the different ways in which you can learn to prep more quickly, more efficiently, and just get overall better at preparing things. But I could make a different video about that, and I know for certain there are other uh, videos, quality videos out there and articles that have been written about ways in which you can learn to prep things more efficiently. So you could take some time, learn that, practice that, train that, and, and get better at your prep work. The second tip is to support creators who provide adventure content. Like I have a Patreon page, lots of other creators have Patreon pages. I put out things like newsletters, sample encounters, uh, creatures with lore and adventure hooks, battle maps, modules, creators such as myself. We produce stuff like this on a regular basis so that GMs have these great resources to draw upon. You can get the content that is easily modifiable for you to fit it into your adventure. Or in some cases, it's so well prepped, you can just drop it in pretty easily. Some creators put out free content. I know I put out some free content every single month, but beyond that, subscriptions usually are not very much. For just a small amount, uh, $10, $5, $3 even sometimes a month, you can get access to a ton of this content. And 
really that monthly amount is so small you don't even notice it. I support a few creators on Patreon myself and I like to get things such as battle maps and uh, ideas and adventure hooks and, and monster concepts. So definitely go make usage of that. Even if you just go and get the free content, there's lots of cool resources out there that you can draw upon. So let me know, how do you handle travel encounters? I think that it is a wonderful element of RPGs. It's not something I would want to get rid of. I do use different methods and approaches at different times, depending upon the campaign, depending upon where the characters are. I love making random tables. I think they're a lot of fun and I do what I can to uh, make them implement without too much of a, of a hiccup or a road bump whenever we come across them in the campaign. All right, so that's all I got for this video. That was a lot of information to consider. I hope that it's helpful for you and uh, thank you very much for watching. As always, may your adventures be many.